Hi, I'm Tim Belcher. Welcome back to the channel. Have you ever seen these? Let's make our own. Let's make some lake art with lasers. This is how I made it. In Virginia, just outside of Roanoke, is one of my favorite places. We've been lucky enough to have a place on Smith Mountain Lake for several years now. It's a man-made lake created by damming the Roanoke and the Blackwater Rivers with a hydroelectric dam. It created a very deep, absolutely beautiful freshwater lake in the mountains of Western Virginia. Now as a quick PSA, don't Google lake map and then look at the shopping options unless you're really interested in buying one. They are filled with these laser cut lake maps and while I absolutely love them, some of the resellers behind these products will track you with ninja level cookies and you'll see these advertisements everywhere for years. At least that's what happened to me. I've done lake art projects before, specifically with Smith Mountain Lake. And this one I did on the CNC is above our mantle and it's certainly one of my favorites to date. And I've been given lake art projects as gifts. In fact, not long after we got the house here, my sister-in-law bought this one for us, which is from a small business out of Detroit called Lake Art LLC. As I mentioned, I had seen their ads and had seen them quite often, but they didn't make me want to buy one. They just continually made me want to make one, made me want to figure out how to make one. And when I joined some laser cutting groups on Facebook, I noticed this type of art is frequently posted. It seems a quite popular part of small laser businesses, but I noticed people posting would rarely give any tips on how to do this yourself. And that is fine with me. There's certainly no requirement for people to share. It did make me want to figure out the details even more though. So as soon as I got my laser, off I went to figure out their process. And I'm going to share that with you here, start to finish. The first secret is that most of these providers actually use Google Maps, the same Google Maps we use every day. But it doesn't look like Google Maps, right? We're all used to the map view or the satellite view and you may or may not even know that there's a terrain view. But just screenshotting a Google Map and trying to edit it would be quite the exercise. What they do is use the Google Maps API or the Application Programming Interface. That's a set of software interfaces that let developers access the core components of Google Maps. Don't worry, we're not going to program anything. Just stay with me. If you look at the Google Map APIs and then dig down to the style section, you can see that you can request and modify all sorts of information on a map. These include administrative information like county, city, even neighborhood names, landscape information, points of interest like parks and tourist attractions, roads, road names, and highway numbers, and finally, even water. And that's everything we need to make a basic map. So how do we modify these things without programming? Let me introduce you to Snazzy Maps. Now there are other companies like this, but Snazzy Maps allows us to do what we need to do on a small scale for free. As an overview, I'm simply going to use this site to turn off everything from the map except for the specific things I want to show and then take pictures of them. I'm going to start by selecting this style of blue water just because it's a bit more basic. In the end, it doesn't matter though, as we'll actually choose the Customize Style button and make our own. And now you see what this site allows. Here are your administrative, your landscape, POI, road, and water options. You can control almost every aspect of the lines, the text, the color, the saturation, the gamma, etc. I'm going to go into each one. I'll start with Administrative and choose the All option and turn Visibility off. This will turn everything associated with administrative off. I'll then go into landscape, point of interest, and roads. Turn them all off until only the water remains. For graphic elements like water or roads, you can edit the weight of the lines or the thickness to get, for instance, thicker shapes of some of these rivers. I'm going to actually reduce them until I get as little as I can except for the main lake. I will then adjust the saturation, the gamma, and the lightness until I get what is essentially a two-color image. 
Then up here on this menu bar is an option to export a photo. The default image is 1000 pixels square, but there's an option to export the photo with three times the resolution, and I'll choose that as well. This is gonna give me a JPEG of just the water that is 3000 pixels by 3000 pixels. I can then grab a picture of the roads by turning off the water and turning on all the road options. There are highway, arterial, and local roads. Some have icons or highway numbers. And I'm simply gonna keep adjusting options until I get something I like. I adjusted the stroke up a little in this example and actually kept the icons, but later I went back and grabbed another photo where the road strokes were thin and I left the highway numbers off. I just think they look better in the final product. Lastly, I'll do the same for the points of interest, and for this lake, that really only means parks. And for all of these pictures, I'm really only after the graphics. I can add text back later in a much better font, and I could even add highway numbers back that look better than the generic Google font, for example. Now I have my three main graphics layers, and I want to convert them to vector images. And I'm going to use a program that's called Image Vectorizer. I work on a Mac and this app is only about $5 from the App Store. You can use online sites that convert images to vectors for free, or use Inkscape which has a trace bitmap feature, again for free. There are many options that will work here. With any of these image tracing operations, you can simply play with the conversion settings until you get a clean image trace, and that's what we want here. But the simple idea is to convert these JPEGs into vectors and specifically EPS files. That's an older vector file format that when opened in most graphics software will make every unconnected shape its own object in the file. And that helps me clean up the images easier and makes it easier to move objects into their own layers or to group them, etc. So now I have my EPS files, so let's move on to actually making the map. And my graphics program of choice lately is Affinity Designer. It's an inexpensive alternative to Adobe Illustrator. However, this is obviously easy to do in Adobe products as well, or even something free like GIMP. And regardless of the software you use, the basic steps are the same, and you should be able to easily Google anything I do in Affinity to find out how to do the same thing in your software. And what I'm doing here as a first step is simply deleting all the water bodies that are not part of the main lake and in the end, I'm left with only that main lake shape. I'll open up the roads EPS file and zoom in and delete any little road bits that are not connected or just look like they don't belong. I'll check the point of interest graphic, which is all those parks, and I don't need to do much here except to remove the Google watermark at the bottom. Now let's create a new document to combine and layer these elements. And I want my final project to be 11 by 17, 11 inches by 17 inches. So for this document, I'm going to go just slightly larger. So I'll do 11 and a half by 17 and a half. I'm going to jump over and grab my shapes. First, the lake, as you see here, and copy and paste them into my new document. As I paste, they will come in as a new layer. And I want the lake to be the bottom layer for now, and then the roads, and finally the points of interest. Now I started off with three images that were each 3,000 pixels wide and tall. However, when I made them vectors, and then further when I cleaned them up, the resulting shapes are no longer matching in size. They are close, but I'll have to stretch and move them to align them by hand. Once into the same document, I'll then select the roads and the lake layers and resize them to match my document size. Before I resize them, I'll simply grab those two layers and align their centers. In Affinity, this is two steps, and this will get me close as the shapes are not too far off from each other. Then I'll spend some time manually adjusting the roads to match the lake layer by switching back and forth into Google Maps and making small adjustments to the roads layer until it matches the lake shape perfectly. I'll check alignment somewhere on the top left of the map and then somewhere in the lower right to make sure the size and position of the roads is correct across the map. You might notice I skipped the part here where I went back and removed the highway numbers on snazzy maps for this road image. The points of interest, or the parks for this map, were a bit easier since they had a very clearly defined shape I could reference on one part of the lake. 
Okay, so now we have our basic map. We just need to add text and other elements to complete it. So I'll choose a nice font and a size that I like and first go through and label the major areas on the map. These are the towns and the areas that people are familiar with. And I'll just use Google Maps as a reference for these major area names and their locations. I will add the names of the two largest park areas. And for this area, that's the Booker T. Washington National Monument and then the Smith Mountain Lake State Park. Now, through the magic of editing, let's fast forward as I added other elements to the map. First, I've added major street names, and let me show you how I did that. Let's take this road, Manita Road, and make it follow the actual road, a small touch that I think makes the map look much better. I'll move it out of the way, and I'll draw a line next to the road where I want the text to go. Then I'll choose text on a line and place the road name in, and adjust it so it looks like it follows the road. And then I can remove the original. This is gonna be different in whatever software you're using, but any of these programs can do this. Then I will make sure that element is placed into the group or layer for road names. Keeping your layers organized is critical when you start applying opacity or color changes. Next, I've added an infographic that gives some high level information about the map the square miles, the shoreline, the depth, and other tidbits. I created a compass by combining shapes that I will cut out of the final map, just like I'll cut the shape of the lake out. I've added some little personal touches, like mark the homes of friends we have here on the lake. I added my logo, because why not, I made it. And I added a title bar at the top of the map, saying Smith Mountain Lake, Virginia, and the latitude and longitude of the lake. And lastly, I have applied an 11 by 17 artboard to the project. And by selecting this artboard when exporting, I'll export only that 11 by 17 portion of the image. By the way, this is why you take your time managing your layers so that you can work on individual components of the map easily. Now I will use that same artboard rectangle to cut out my final map from my stock. If I were using 11 by 17 stock, then I could skip this step but the MDF I am using for this project is 12 by 18. So this brings up another small but important detail. I don't wanna cut through the edges of my stock with the lake portion. So where the lake comes close to that edge, I went through and cut the vector about a quarter of an inch from that 11 by 17 edge. I then took that remaining portion that was cut off and added it to the road layer. Then I could shade it to represent where the lake continues after the cut. I hope that makes sense. I did go through the lake vector and carefully adjust any portions that were simply too small to cut effectively. You want to avoid areas that will simply be too fragile once the cut is made, and editing the vector will be different depending on the software that you use. I also cut the vector in two parts to allow the single bridge we have here on the lake to remain uncut. Okay, let's export these graphics and import them into Lightburn so we can make this map. First, I'll get rid of the lake and the compass, the two parts I'll cut fully out. I will make sure everything else is visible and everything is shaded how I like it. And then I'll export this portion of the map by selecting that artboard and exporting that selection without a background. Then I will reverse my selections and export just the lake and the compass image in the same way. I'll label the first image with etch and the second image with cut. Now into Lightburn, and I'm going to import both graphics, the etch and the cut. I'll rotate them and then center them onto each other. And because I exported them using the artboard, I know the images are the exact same size and will line up correctly. I'll load the etch first and the cut second, and then I'll move the cut to its own layer. I will take the etch layer and hide it for a minute while I work on tracing the cut layer. I'll take a look first at the image trace and make any adjustments I want. I could, for instance, smooth the trace out a bit. And then I will do the trace and use the option to delete the image afterwards. Because I lined up the graphics first, I'm left with the vector line exactly where I need it. I will etch mine in grayscale, which does take some calibration with every material you use. My settings will almost certainly differ from yours, but if you're interested in them, just comment down below. And then I did add a rectangle that was the exact size of my frame opening. I just did this manually in Lightburn and will use that to cut the map free from the material. A little preview, which in grayscale mode is not really accurate, but I've tested my settings and now I'm ready to cut. 
Since I'm cutting a size that will come onto the frame of my honeycomb, I'm using these brass picture hangers to stand off the MDF from the bed. I use the frame function in Lightburn to adjust where my map is on the material, which takes a few tries and adjustments, and then I'm ready to cut. While this etches, let me talk about a few things I didn't do on this map. First, and perhaps the most obvious, I didn't create bathymetric layers for the depth of the lake. When you're talking about lakes, at least in the US, it can be somewhat difficult to find simple depth charts. This is much easier around coastal regions where the federal government has nautical charts available. But for lakes, you're more at the mercy of Google searches. In fact, for many of the US lakes I see, the depth in these laser maps is more of an artist's representation of the depth, to sort of put it nicely. There are several digital sources available online that provide depth information, but capturing them, editing them in this process can be time consuming. I have a feeling for most of these lakes, they use the nautical charts and create their own depth lines for layers. I've done this in the past, and most of what you need to know is actually just expanding on what's already in this video. In fact, I'm working on a coastal region now where I will do depth layers, combining Google Maps with actual nautical charts. So subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you see that project when I'm done. Now I'm gonna reassemble this little puzzle I've made. I wanna remove as much of any smoke stains from the cut, and I find that if I reassemble the piece first, it's actually much easier to clean. And for this, I simply use a little isopropyl alcohol on a paper towel, and that does a pretty good job of removing stains while not discoloring the material. On plywood, I also find that if I do a quick clear coat on both the front and back of the wood first, it also helps to make removing the stains a lot easier. This was the first time I've ever used MDF as a medium for these maps, and it came out well. I may adjust the settings next time to get the etch a little darker, and I may add lines around some of the larger text and vector engrave them. This entire process is very iterative. Each time I make one, I make small adjustments to make the next one better. You're going to find that many of the frames you purchase from Amazon or Target are not really designed for 3mm stock. This is a simple one that has about an 11 by 17 opening, and I'm just going to use some royal blue paper as backing. You can also use this backing paper with a laser to etch in those bathymetric lines, or you could use something like the Cricut to draw whatever features you want. The possibilities here are endless. One of the reasons I like this project so much is that it's a digital first project. I'm not only left with a great looking map, but more importantly, I now have the artwork. In my next video, I'm going to make some changes to this map so that it can be etched into some of those Yeti knockoff tumblers. And I'm also working on a leather wallet design that will use the laser to etch in a version of this map. Once you have the digital art and are comfortable with modifying it, you can use it in all sorts of projects. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, give it a like and hit that subscribe button. And if you're interested in creating these types of laser cut maps, I hope this video helped. Thanks for watching.